Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. Thanks for tuning in today. I'm excited for this chat that we're about to have with Dr. Sean Tesson. Tesson? I should have asked you. Tesson. Tesson. Dr. Tesson is a board certified in obstetrics and gynecology and by the American Board of Integrative Medicine. He holds a medical degree in addition to a PhD in mind-body medicine. In his 20 years of practice, Dr. Tasson has seen over 40,000 women and is a highly regarded patient advocate. As an integrative health practitioner, Dr. Tasson believes that you should have an active role in your care. His work includes studies and publications on spirituality and medical care, whole foods to heal the human body, and integrative medicine. Dr. Tasson is a HarperCollins author and has been featured in many publications, including the New York Times, NBC News Online, and Stanford MedX. So welcome, Dr. Tasson. Thanks for having me. Yes. And so I really want to get into, you know, bridging together Western and Eastern medicine when it comes to women's hormone health. And I know that you are the expert on this, but it, you did not start this way, did you? I mean, you were in obstetrics, you were in traditional medical worlds that suddenly got shifted and you started to integrate a little bit of alternative medicine. So how, how did that happen? <laughs> Yeah, no, I did. I started in obstetrics and gynecology residency, just like everybody else, uh, trained in that kind of allopathic model where we used to jokingly say we would heal with steel. Like we. Oh, you know, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I remember saying that. And uh, in my second year of residency, I, um, my mom was diagnosed with ovarian cancer at the age of 51. Wow. And, um, I, I went, watched her, you know, being an only child, I watched her go through the chemo and the surgery and all of the things that she'd had to go through. And I knew a lot about the disease, but what I found out after she passed away five years later that I didn't know how to help her live her best life. Like I, I, I couldn't help her with the pain of the chemo or the, the nausea. And all I knew was medications and surgery and, and she, she passed away anyways. I didn't have a way to help her over those five years live a good life. And I kind of went on a little journey when she died and um, tried to make myself uh, better. Um, and I think indirectly, I was reading this book. I was in, you know, when you go on a spiritual journey, you obviously have to go to Sedona. So I was in Sedona. I lived in Tucson. It was right up the road a couple hours. And I went to Sedona and I was reading this book at the time that was just crazy. It was by Andrew Weil and it was called Eight Weeks to Optimum Health. And this was, you know, 15 years ago. And he was talking in this book about crazy stuff like fish oil and CoQ10 and all this stuff. And I was like, this is crazy stuff. I mean, I never heard this. It was... <laughs> so at the end of the book, they have this fellowship at the University of Arizona uh, in integrative medicine. And it just really struck a chord with me. I was already living in Tucson, which is where the U of A was. And it just was kind of like serendipitous. So I did the program in 2005 and did two years with them. And then in that program, there was an eight week spirituality chapter, uh, section. And it really just conked me on the head. Like, wow, this is amazing that you can have like, not necessarily religion, but spiritual practice, meditation, yoga, whatever it is, and, and have that as a healing process. So then naturally I did a, a five year, uh, six year, it took me six years to do the PhD in philosophy where I traveled around and wow. worked with indigenous shamans and, and just did kind of uh, all that interesting stuff. And, and now I guess the side effect of that, if you will, is that I, I, I kind of treat things, I can do surgery. I actually do robotic surgery, which is obviously very, technical and, 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 and uh, surgical, but I also can look at things um, from a more integrated perspective. So I think the, the concept of integration for me is integrating everything that I've learned. Wow. And so when you were working with indigenous shamans, where was that? Oh, I've done that all over. I've, yeah. I've, worked, in, I've worked with people from Guatemala and Peru. Um, the the the, uh, I've, I've worked with just some friends of mine in, in Sedona, different uh, Mexico, yeah. uh, Canada, just different areas and um, have done some pretty, I've seen some pretty amazing things yeah. uh, and done some pretty amazing things. And I think that um, 
some of my favorite memories were with um, the uh, Peruvian um, uh, uh, shaman that really kind of showed me how to look at disease as more of an energetic imbalance. And I, mm -hmm. I, I will say that even though I've seen some pretty miraculous things, it's still hard as a concept to, um, to you know, to, I've seen it, I, I understand it, but sometimes that, you know, our, my brain gets in the way too. Oh, like, I can imagine, yeah. It's, it's just, as a human being and living in this culture, it's hard to sometimes understand that and for some people it may seem obvious, but like if you, you know, HeartMath, which is a company here that talks about heart rate variability and how um, the more variable your heart rate is, um, meaning like if you inhale, the heart rate speeds up and when you exhale, it slows down. The more that your heart swings like that, the more healthy you are and the more happy you are. And if one person walks into a room that has a, a, a negative kind of attitude and their heart rate variability is down, they can affect other people in a room. And, wow. and that's been shown. And I've seen that, but it's hard sometimes for me, even my daily life, you know, even taking care of myself to, to, to do that on a daily basis. Yeah. So what were you just like, how did you end up connecting with these shamans? Just out of my own curiosity, was it like going down and traveling in Peru and then you'd end up meeting these shamans that would then you'd work with, or did you go with purpose? Like, I'm going to go work with this person. Um, sometimes, the, you know, it's kind of a funny saying, or it's not a funny saying, it's a known saying that if, when you're ready, the teacher Yes, yes. But, that's why I ask. Yeah, and sometimes, I mean, initially I met, um, I read a book um, by a, a, uh, an author named James Andretti from, uh, he was living in Sedona at the time. I met James. James worked a lot with the Huichol, H-U-I-C-H-O-L. Uh, mm -hmm. The Huichol are the, per, uh, the peyote shamans in Guatemala. And they don't just take people in. You have to, you have to know them and get to know them because it's a very sacred part of their life. These plant medicines are not something that they, you know, they're not touristy things. And mm -mm. and so for uh, you have to kind of get to know people and then and then visit. And so it just kind of happened over time that once I started to to do this, and then I I I, met, I knew I met people like Larry Dossey, who's a uh, an author that has written a lot about non-local healing and um, people like Deepak Chopra and, and, and through kind of these chance meetings, you meet other people. And then it just would sort of happen that um, I would be invited to work with uh, somebody with a, an ayahuasca ceremony or something okay, like yeah, that. Yeah. So you just sort of, I think if you're open to the concept and you aren't necessarily looking, so Americans we tend to look at it and go, I'm going to go to the Amazon and I'm going to find somebody and I'm going to do ayahuasca. ayahuasca yeah. and, and that's fine. But I think that you kind of miss the point. Sometimes I think that if, if you, and it might not be ayahuasca for you, it might be that you put yourself out there because you have some healing that needs to happen and, and you might meet, uh, you might meet a priest or you might, I mean, it, 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 I think we force it sometimes and I'm guilty of I, I force things. I try to force things all the time. And I think that when you let it happen, um, that's when the, the healing probably happens. More yeah. Much. I think it's really hard for us in North America to just let it, those things happen. And I know I, when I was in my early 20s, I traveled and that was when I first saw what life could be like when you would just let life happen and these weird things would unfold in your day and it would just take you to these chance circumstances. And, and I'll have to tell you this story because where I was, I was drawn to this little tiny village in Mexico that I would go back to all the time. And I felt this really crazy connection to this place. And I met this person there that told me, she was like a clairvoyant lady. And she said, just so you know, you're drawn to this place because you were a Weechel Indian in your past life. And I was like, oh, you know, I'm like 20 drinking, you know, <laughs> down in Mexico, like whatever kind of thing. And then over the years that I was down there, I had all these strange circumstances where twice the chief of the Weechel Indian pulled me aside. One time he pulled me aside, he took me to this sacred spot out on the cliffs and did a peyote ceremony with me, not a pay without the peyote. He did a ceremony with me and we like, we offered an offering to his peyote God. And then we did a peyote ceremony with a, a couple of other people. And then another time he came in and he asked me um, if I would come to their village up in the hills to do their three day peyote ceremony. 
And I, I said no to that one because I was it was too much for me at that time I was at a young age. But I think that that's you know like, it's very interesting. That's why I had asked you so like, do these things just happen? Because that's how it happened for me, and it's how I came into doing body work and getting into kind of a spiritual side was through travel and these people that I would meet, these shamans and same thing. But I think a lot of the listeners probably don't really understand what their kind of medicine is in comparison to standard medical care that we see here. So how is it that you've been able to bring that and what does that look like into your practice now with women and their hormones? Um, what I've kind of looked at when I look talking to um, women for the last you know, 15 years, I think that um, it's made me a better listener, first of all. And what I found was that in, in hormones, a lot of the women that would come in, the hormones would, it was a story. Um, and, and listening to these stories over and over and over again, I kind of fell into, I, I basically kind of came up with like 12, what I call archetypes. So like all of these, if you distilled all of these thousands of stories into information, that's what the hormone imbalances was talking about. So these um, 12 uh, archetypes are the stories that these women were telling. So um, say something like uh, testosterone deficiency, which is uh, uh, very common. It's probably the number one thing that I see. Um, that was telling me this story that I ended up calling the nun, you know, N-U-N, nun. And because, and women get, get a little bit frustrated with that because they feel like, you know, nun is like a negative thing. But the reality is a nun is, you know, very educated, very loyal, very uh, dedicated to uh, a passionate person. They just don't have, they're not known for being very energetic and gregarious and they, they might feel kind of flattened and uh, they might be more cloistered. So they might, they might separate themselves from the world. And, and that's kind of the story that testosterone deficiency would, would tell was that storyline. You know, you're not interested in sex, your energy is down. Things that used to make you happy before aren't making you happy anymore. You're, you might be, you know, working out isn't as good and you just feel kind of like a, a different person and and so I was thinking about this and I was like well how do we fix this well I can give testosterone and that's definitely one thing that I can definitely do but over time I kind of looked at it um, and thought well uh, there's a six-step process that I've come up with that involves not just hormones but a spiritual practice so all 12 of these stories can benefit from a spiritual practice like you know what what could a, a nun benefit from well they're very much into learning and very much into, um, you know, being kind of dedicated to uh, or passionate about something. So trying to find something that they're passionate about and whether that's something, you know, it doesn't have to be religious. It can be whatever they're passionate about. So a spiritual practice, hormones, and then something I call infoceutical information. And that was just kind of a, a fancy way of saying like the energetic aspect of that storyline. And so, acupuncture, essential oils, uh, massage, you know, ways to uh, treat things energetically. Nutrition is probably the biggest piece. Um, exercise is another piece. And then finally, probably at the bottom would be supplementation. So some women could do better with plant medicines, you know, supplements like bean or, um, you know, tribulus or something like that to get a, a boost from testosterone. So trying to give women a plan like that that involves multiple choices that they can try that, you know, some women want that hormone because it gives them, you know, the immediate effect, but then how do they also then work in other things? Whereas others may not really want to try hormones because they're concerned about them or they don't like the idea of a medication. They can have other options as well. Mm -hmm. What do you think causes the low testosterone? Because I know that high testosterone we see is being like the driving factor behind PCOS, which is, you know, a leading cause of infertility for women, which is driven by high testosterone, which is driven by high sugar. So is what's driving the low testosterone? Is that just an age thing? If you're seeing, like, I find it strange that I've heard you say this before on podcasts that when people take your hormone test that you see low testosterone over anything else, which 
I think a lot of women probably wouldn't think that. They would just think, well, all my estrogen, my progesterone are, are low. Well, the testosterone being low, I think, is a few things. One would probably be um, a lot of us in this country are overweight, and abdominal fat uh, can definitely lower testosterone. The other thing, and you kind of alluded to this, women who have higher estrogen levels, whether it's PCOS or birth control pill or something you know that's causing them to be highly estrogenic obesity, estrogen raises something called sex hormone binding globulin. And when the sex hormone binding globulin goes up, your free testosterone levels drop pretty significantly. And the free testosterone is that testosterone that's actually active in your body. So um, those things are, they go hand in hand. High, high estrogen lowers testosterone every time. And, and we not only have an obesity epidemic, but we have estrogen in our foods. We have, um, we have estrogenic um, things that we eat all the time that contain soy or other isoflavones um, that I think, you know, we have estrogen in fish. We have, I mean, we just in our meats. And so I think we're just a highly estrogenized society. Mm -hmm. So then that's driving the testosterone down because of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's the archetype that you think goes along with the high estrogen then? So high estrogen. So high estrogen is, I call those women the uh, queens because estrogen is obviously the predominantly female hormone. And when you're super estrogenized, you're a super human female. So that's a queen. Um, they're in charge, in, in charge of everything. And what's interesting is that queens can be great and benevolent and they can be off with your head type queens, which is exactly what happens with high estrogen is you have mood swings and irritability and um, you are constantly you know, on edge and, and that's kind of how it is. And so for, for those women, the spiritual practice that I, that I give them is uh, for queen to be supported, to be taken care of, to surround herself with uh, advisors and i.e. other women or other people that support you and will take care of you because the key there is going to be self-care, whether it's, you know, trying to get those estrogen levels down through exercise or proper nutrition or um, other means. Um, you need people around you that are going to support you. And then, um, trying not to be and trying to overcome this i think the other thing is when women get that way where they feel kind of out of control they get labeled as a you know bitch or you know oh it's you know and for guys you know if guys get in a bad mood it's not a big deal mm -hmm. but for women to be that way with their kids or in the marketplace or whatever it seems to be you know obviously you're judged more than it is for a guy so then you add that pressure on top of it and I think it just makes the whole thing a big, you know, set of dominoes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I totally agree with that. Yeah. And for so when women are going through perimenopause, we start to see a lot of these hormonal shifts starting to happen. And I would love to know what tools you have for the women that are maybe deficient in these, you know, the progesterone, the estrogen, obviously the testosterone. Um, that you can, that the, these women can maybe take with them after our talk today that they can start applying to their own lives? Well, things that people can start right away. Um, the one hormone that doesn't get talked about a lot is cortisol. And mm -hmm. cortisol is hard to test unless you do a urine or a salivary test. But cortisol gets missed a lot. And, and I think we do have an epidemic of probably both high yeah. and low cortisol for women, for sure. I think that I call those the women with high cortisol workaholics and women with low cortisol saboteurs because women that have low cortisol are doing everything that they can for everybody else and sabotaging their own health. And that low cortisol is kind of the phase after a high cortisol. So those women, they work, 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 burn themselves out. And then, then they're kind of stuck in that phase. So I think, you know, primarily it's kind of about self care, you know, um, and it's a, it's a phrase that we throw around all the time, but, you know, proper yeah. sleep, I think sleep is, is, is primary. It's essential. It's, I don't, I, I'm not a great sleeper myself, but you just don't feel right when you no. don't. Sleep. And your cortisol gets messed up when you don't sleep and your melatonin is messed up if you don't sleep. And we have studies that show women who are insomniacs tend to have higher rates of breast cancer. And we think it's because melatonin levels are lower and melatonin is a really great antioxidant. And so that can really mess things up long term. Um, I think, uh, you know, having a, a good 
um, you know, it's, it's silly, but a good uh, regimen every day. And I, there's something that I tell women to do, if you can do this, it's not easy, but it is easy at the same time. For the last 15 to 60 seconds of your shower, turn the water as cold as you can. Mm -hmm. That kind of is a reset button. And, and, and uh, Wim Hof, the, the notorious yeah. fellow that uh, dunks himself in cold water. There's Freezes his retinas. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there's a reason for that. This yeah. cold actually resets things. Tony Robbins has a mm -hmm. cold tank at his house. And, and, and that every morning is, if you can do it for even 15 seconds, I, I will tell you it's not easy, but it is easy. Um, and then even, even, even eating something like uh, a little square of super dark chocolate, you know, 77% or higher. Um, I've often tried that myself where I've bought, uh, you know, from milk chocolate all the way up <laughs> to a hundred percent cacao and the hundred percent is really brutal. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, it's really, you should try that with friends someday and, and buy like 10 different strengths and, and really try them and go up the scale because some people can do it. They can get to like a hundred and they're, they're like, it's not great, but I can do it. And I mean, for me, it's just brutal. I can get up yeah. to about... 80% and then I'm like this isn't I can't even do this anymore no but, but that's good for blood it's good for circulation and it's easy to do um, and I think you know 67% or higher probably is good um, but those those things are rather easy and the one supplement that I go to religiously over and over and over again is maca I think yeah. oh, maca cool. is a super important supplement for women um, the thing that is the downer about maca is that there's so many products out there. Um, about five, six years ago, uh, China came in and bought the entire crop of maca, and then they took it and they pulverized it and they mixed it with a bunch of other stuff. And so some of the <clears throat> powders that are out there may not contain a lot of maca. Um, a company called Symphony came in about two years after that and then bought all the land so that, the, that China couldn't do that anymore and they pay fair wages now to the Peruvians that harvest it. And maca is very specific. So there's 13 different types of maca. Uh, black maca that's grown in a certain part of Peru may have a different quality if it's grown in another part of Peru. There's some maca that's good for men. There's some that's good for post-menopause. There's some good for fertility. Oh, wow. so you really need to know which product you're using. And the one that I recommend, I don't get any money from them, is uh, Feminescence, which um, is a combination between the words feminine and essence. Um, they have done all the studies that I've ever seen on maca. Uh, they make it. There's one. There's one particular kind for men. There's there's one for uh, maca harmony, which is good for fertility patients or those with PCOS. I have, <clears throat> and there's one called maca pause for menopause. And and I have never probably 80% of the time I put somebody on maca, they they do wonderful. Um, and it's just a really good, it's got a lot of fiber, so it's good for you. But I would try that before anything, anything. else. Wow. dollars probably for six weeks, not too expensive. No, and I've heard now, I've heard mixed reviews on what hormones it will increase because I, I remember hearing years back when I was going to try it, that it, it increases estrogen. And that's why it's so good for women that are in perimenopause or menopause and not so much for someone that's got endometriosis or somebody that's estrogen dominant. But then I've heard, no, it's an adaptogenic, that it'll kind of go towards either testosterone pathway or an estrogen pathway, depending on which one needs more. Um, I had Dr. Anna Kavek on recently, and she was like, it'll go down DHEA, it'll, go, it'll give you whatever it is you need. So what's your opinion on that? Do, what do you see in your practice? Yeah, so Anna is, you know, she has a Mighty Maca product, and um, she's a friend of mine. It's a, it's a great product, too. Um, maca, we don't know why it works. That's the thing. We, we yeah. don't necessarily know what it's doing or why it's doing it. And if you look at studies, it doesn't significantly raise the level. So women that are on, you know, women that have breast cancer that might be estrogen receptor positive, who I do have some of those women actually on estrogen. They're, they're patients of mine. I've known them for years. They're miserable. They, they, they know that there's a risk, but they are so miserable. They, they want to be on estrogen. Um, but maca in and of itself isn't necessarily going to raise your estrogen levels to a super, sorry, I'm trying to fix my hair. A, <laughs> um, a super dangerous level. It, it's just going to balance things out a little bit and take the edge off. That's kind of how I talk to people. It's more of an, it takes the edge off of yeah. How much do you recommend taking? 
So most of the, most of the maca that I use is about two grams a day. Um, it usually is about two capsules. So the problem, if you buy a product like Anna's, who I would trust her product because she mm -hmm. researched it and, and it, if it says it's in there, it's probably in there. The problem that I have is when patients come in and they have a bag of maca that they bought in bulk. I, I don't know what's in it. I don't on know. On Amazon, yeah. Yeah, and so that stuff I probably wouldn't necessarily spend the money on. But you want, just want, just like with any supplements, you want to get a good brand, you know, something mm -hmm. that's uh, reputable, that, that does, has inspection, and they've tested it and make sure that it's actually in there. Yeah, yeah. And then how often are you using, um, uh, like, bioidentical hormones in conjunction with your natural supplements and your lifestyle recommendations? Like, are you, with your clients, do you really try to go down the natural route first, or do you like to combine because I know you're, you're in both worlds, so. I think it depends on, I will usually give most of those recommendations that I talked about. Um, most people I think are willing to definitely go the supplement route. Um, so probably more than half want to probably go with a hormonal route, especially women that are younger that have issues like say with progesterone deficiency and they're really suffering with insomnia. You know, one of the like one of the things I'll recommend for them is hops. I, I have a lot of good success with hops for insomnia, or you can recommend valerian or something like that. But sometimes those women have tried everything, melatonin, they've tried everything out there, and nothing is really as good as sometimes progesterone can be, especially if that's what you're low in. Um, so it really depends on the person. I, I recommend three things for almost everybody. I usually recommend maca. Uh, a good fish oil supplement and and magnesium. Those kind of three things I think are essential, you know, starting blocks for almost everybody. Uh, basically, then you know, looking at somebody's, you can't really talk about hormones and not talk about nutrition, as you would, you know, back up and and probably some sort of exercise regimen. Now, some women, if they have super low cortisol, I might recommend that they don't exercise. Yeah, because yeah, they me can too. Attack themselves and. And, and so, and other women, I might recommend like a high intensity interval thing, like an orange theory or, or something like that. So it really just depends on what the imbalance is. And, but I will usually give kind of the multiple recommendations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. And then when it comes to the cortisol, are you seeing more adrenal insufficiency or are you seeing more high cortisol in women, in aging women? I, I would have to say overall, and it's just really interesting. I mm -hmm. see a lot of women that almost have both throughout mm -hmm. the day. Um, if I had to pick one, I would say probably high cortisol is more prominent. Um, but what I've been seeing lately are women that start out in the mornings super high. And then throughout the day, it usually you know goes up in the afternoon, kind of comes or in the morning, mid morning, kind of dips in the afternoon and then bottoms towards the evening. That's when you're going to bed. And I tend to see women with patterns where they're, they wake up higher than normal. They kind of hit the mid-morning and they're probably in the normal area. And then hitting the afternoon, they drop again. And then before they go to bed, it starts to go up again. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that is um, they're anxious about sleep. Um, then they don't sleep. So they wake up with their cortisol elevated. They are drinking a bunch of coffee. So it's kind of maintaining itself. And then they're crashing in the afternoon. And then in the evening, their kids are getting ready for bed. Their stress is going up. Um, and they're starting to worry about sleep again. So they're getting all worked up and the cortisol rises again, which is really a challenge because I think if you can focus, that's why I say if you can focus on the sleep, you could probably fix two thirds of the day um, and, and, and be a lot better off. It's just that we don't really put a whole lot of uh, emphasis on sleep because I think in this culture, we feel like, you know, taking a nap or sleeping, you know, we talk about sleeping eight hours a day, but not many people can get that in. No, I know. And in your eyes, how important is mixing these two worlds between the Western and Eastern medicine? Because I think most women nowadays, because of our culture, we just want to take the pill. We want to take the hormones. We want to, we want the easy fix, but how often do you see that that actually works just, just to do the hormones without the lifestyle recommendations or the spirituality part? Uh, it will work and it works a majority of the time. It just doesn't work for a long time. 
Ah. So I can fix it, uh, and but I'm not really fixing it, right? So band aiding. Yeah. So I can I can use a birth control pill to override PCOS, and you'll have a withdrawal bleed or what we would call a period, but it isn't really a period. But I'm not fixing it. Or I can give a woman uh, progesterone to help her sleep at night, but I'm not really fixing the underlying problem that is maybe her pattern or her sleep hygiene isn't the greatest at night when she goes to bed. Like she's waking up at two and reading her phone, or you know maybe she's not exercising enough, or she's exercising at night when she should be doing it during the morning. Um, and 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 diet is huge. I, I've really started going towards recommending intermittent fasting to mm -hmm. most of my patients now um, and it's controversial I think um, I get criticized a friend of mine uh, Nat Kringutis um, who's in Australia just got criticized uh, pretty vehemently by some people because people think that it's a diet and you're promoting body image and the reality is intermittent fasting you're just you're not eating for 16 hours and then you're kind of eating for the other eight but what it does is it rests your gut for 16 hours. I think we have, and I'm, maybe this wouldn't agree, you wouldn't agree with this, but I think we have this feeling in our culture that you know, in, breakfast is the most important meal of the day, but it's no. not. It's just no. calories. And, and what do we eat for breakfast in this country? Juice, uh, milk, bagels. I mean, Cereal. It's all, it's all carbs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and sure, if you're hungry, you have some eggs or something. But, um, um, but I think what... If you can um, focus on things like fasting and eating right, that's going to be the first step. That's why I say if I had to look at my six steps that I talked about earlier, the base is nutrition. But that is the hardest one to get people to switch because yeah. food is life. It's, it's, it's your upbringing. It's, it's all these things, as you're aware. You, know, you talk to people probably every day about nutrition, and it's ingrained. I'm the same way. I would much rather have a hamburger than a salad just because that's what I like. It makes me feel good, at least while I'm eating it. And so, um, and working out is hard, you know, who wants to take the time? So it, there's a lot of that in there. So I do think we go to the pills um, because it is easier for sure, but, you know, and it will work, but it's not necessarily fixing the problem. Or, or it's going to fix it for, for a little while and then start to you'll start to get the symptoms again and no i find like i think there's majority of women that i work with now i'm inter helping them with the intermittent fasting for different lengths of time throughout the day because it really is an a, an easy answer for some women for nutrition because you get the benefits of a calorie restriction without actually lowering your metabolism and having to starve yourself for you know days on end right so for yeah, and I, I, I do it every day, Same. Uh, or at least try to. I, I would recommend people maybe try three days a week to start with so you don't get like overwhelmed because it sounds horrible, but once you do it, and if you can't do 16, do 12. I mean, you can change it around, but really once you start doing it, it's really not a big deal. I mean, it just sort no. of becomes what you do. Yeah, I always tell women it's it's like a muscle that'll get stronger and you can start with three days a week of just doing like a 16 and eight and then even just keep it at the three days a week, but try to extend the hours, right? So that maybe on those three days, you're just maybe eating from either from lunch, and lunch dinner and a snack or even I have some of my clients and members that will not eat until dinner time on some days, like just changing it around and the the results are pretty incredible, like of what it's doing for and how it's helping people, right? Because we're not putting them on this caloric restriction for long periods of time, which all we know backfires. So it's kind of like you get your cake, you, you know, you get to eat it too, sort of thing, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> the I, best I, of both. What I found with myself is when I've started doing that, I don't eat as much. Like even when no. I do, yeah. I don't eat a lot. Like people have said to me, you didn't eat like, half of your stuff and I just what you find is that you get used to being without food you're you're satiated a lot quicker like mm -hmm. it's not like you got to eat it all and I grew up Italian so you eat it all you know I mean that's what we did and grandma would you know make us eat everything so um it's it's it just kind of it kind of cascades yeah yeah and I see men especially it raises your testosterone, which I think it doesn't for women, I don't think, but for men it does. And I think that that's a really easy hack for men is start fasting if you want to raise your, your testosterone. 
<laughs> it's great. Unlike women, but women, I think we need to be a little more careful. Our hormonal state makes it, you know, we have to be more careful with it, but it's definitely such a great way to help with the weight loss and help balance those hormones out. It's very anti-aging too, right? Cal caloric restrictions, one of the best anti-aging yeah. tools. We know people that eat less, live longer. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I did hear some guy on a podcast yesterday who was saying women over 40 should only eat two meals a day and it should all be raw. <laughs> I was like, oh, I so disagree with you, but <laughs> that's not good. I don't know why he's, because I think he was getting into the anti-aging thing, but I think that raw food alone will age you faster than anything, unfortunately. I've had to eat raw food before. I, I kind of feel like maybe there's a little bit of a political agenda behind some of that too, and it's hard yeah. to parcel all that out. But the reality is I think, um, you know, any it's moderation. I mean, yep. just do raw, to just do vegan, to just do carnivore. I mean, there's all these things now and it's like, why can't we just be Eat moderate well. yeah. and, and enjoy food? Because food for us is very social. Um, and, and, but just not overdo it either in any direction. It doesn't have to. And then people feel guilty because, you know, whatever. And I always tell patients, that's like, you know, if you had, if, if there's, if you had the pie or whatever, okay, well don't eat it again tomorrow, you know, start over and, and whatever, but don't beat yourself up. It's, you know, I grew up Catholic, so that Catholic guilt always, but you know, part of it is just, you know, you're human, you know, you're a human being and you know, nobody's going to sit there on their deathbed and say, Oh, I wish I wouldn't have eaten that piece of cake that one Saturday. I mean, yeah, you know, no. <laughs> it's just enjoy it. If you're going to eat it and you make the decision to do it, just enjoy it and then move on. Move on fast the next day, yeah. <laughs> right? Push the reset button. Yes. Um, so any last parting words for the audience, any tips, tools of what you could help women as far as their hormone health and bridging these two worlds together? I always tell women, you know, because by the time they come see me, whether it's in the office or a virtual visit, um, they've usually seen somebody two or three times and they've had their hormones drawn um, and they've been told they're normal. Well, everything looks great. You're fine. And she doesn't feel fine. She's gained weight. She's tired. She's, you know, joints are achy. And she's told that not only is she normal, she's probably just because she's getting older. And I just, that doesn't, that's not normal. So mm -hmm. something isn't normal. And usually what they're doing is when doctors tell you that it's normal, that's because they're looking at you as a range of numbers. And your, your let's say your free T3, which is your active thyroid, is 2.3. Well, 2.3 to 4.7 is normal. We could double that normal number and you'd still be normal, but you might feel a hell of a lot better, you know? So I, I, I tend to tell women, you know, if you don't feel normal, then that's not normal. And so you should keep pushing until you find a provider that's willing to help. Awesome. And so you work with people virtually, you're telling me. So how do people, so can, are, do you have an open practice right now? Can people still book with you? Are you full? No, I can. Yeah, you can. You can see me. It's uh, my website is my last name. It's tassonemd.com, uh, t a s s o n e m d dot com backslash uh, the number one on one uh, consultations. And you can either just buy a consult, or you can buy a consult with a Dutch test, which is a twenty four hour urine test, and uh, we'll get all your numbers. I can order blood and run it through your insurance because um, I'm a physician, so. And blood is, you know, usually covered by insurance. So um, for those people that don't want to try the Dutch test, which does give us cortisol and some other things, um, we do need blood for thyroid and vitamin D, though. Um, we can order all that and, and see kind of where you are in the range. You know, are you in the 20th percentile for thyroid or the 80th? And, and really kind of is your estrogen and progesterone ratio, you know, it's the ratio. It's not necessarily are they normal. I like to see the ratio at about 10 to 1. A lot of women are 500 to 1, and that's estrogen dominance. It combines sometimes with progesterone deficiency. So a lot of water retention and weight gain and all these things, and yet somebody told them they're normal. And so, uh, yeah, you can you can pick and choose, and um, or you can find a functional medicine provider, hopefully, in your area. Mm -hmm. I, I love that people can come see you because I think that we're in such a need of more doctors like yourself that are available, right? So I think for people that are looking for somebody that 
they should, I'm going to put the link in the show notes to you guys. So make sure you check that out and you can go onto a site and you could book an appointment with them, which I think is fantastic. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, I think you've taught my listeners a lot. And I think about the importance of bringing these two worlds together when it comes to our hormone health. So thank you so much. Hey, thanks for having me. It's been great.